Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? And thank you so much for joining us. We are excited to be here. I invite you to set your mind on things above. We gather to remind ourselves that our Savior Jesus has done great things, has he not? Amen, church. Let's put our hands together. We say, Jesus, we love you. We worship you this morning. Let's worship. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Yep. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Declare. He has the great Oh, you of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captain, break every chain. Oh, God, you have the great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken to life. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God. my firm foundation we sing the rock on which I stand everything around me is shaking yep I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus cause he's never let me down he's faithful through change I would 
Church, the Bible reminds us and tells us that our Savior, Jesus, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is with us. He is here. Church, let's declare this together. We trust in Him and His faithfulness.
Amen, church. What a joy to gather together to remind ourselves of that. that Jesus is our foundation, that he won't fail us, that we can trust in him because of what he's done. We've seen him do incredible and marvelous things in our story. We've seen God give us life and life to the, to the full through Jesus. And so church, we cling to him this morning. We give our allegiance to him and him alone. We get off the throne of our hearts and say, Jesus, we surrender to you. You are all powerful. There's no name above your name, Jesus, you reign. So church, as we continue to worship, let's lift our voices together, declare this, God, your name is beautiful and powerful. We worship you.
seat. Ever since we got married, uh, but about 18 years ago, we connected with Cyprian and Margaret Masimbe, who are church planters in Uganda. And uh, first visited them uh, a couple years later, and Kathy got to know Margaret. And it's just been a really great opportunity to see God working in a different culture. When VG was just kind of a dream, and Drew was sharing sharing it with me, Cyprian really loved the idea because that's their DNA: is let's go plant plant new churches. Uh, so over the years, it's been great. We started out planting churches. I uh, first met Cyprian, there were two churches as part of the system. We're up to 15 now. In fact, uh, during the COVID, three new churches were planted. In our last trip, we were able to visit a couple of them and preach there. It was great to, to see that happening. Um, also, you guys know all about Proxy Coffee. Uh, that came about with a connection with the refugee camps up in the north from South Sudan Civil War, uh, planting churches in the refugee camps and among refugees in the rural areas there. So that's, that's going strong. Kind of our main uh, deal right now is, is training pastors. Uh, we have all these rural pastors who want to get out there and minister but have no opportunity for uh, formal or non-formal training. So we began Frontier Force Bible Institute where we actually go through a, a curriculum where we're training them uh, to be pastors. So that's been very rewarding. And this time we just came to um, focus on a marriage conference. And then in that marriage conference, we had them think about, well, what if marriage wasn't just for the two of you? It was also to build um, a communitas, a relationship together with a common master and a common mission. It was really a great time. We you know, got to tell our story of our marriage and things that we worked through. And Cyprian and Margaret were able to do the same thing. Uh, at one point, all four of us were on the stage answering questions. Um, so Thursday, that was the second last day of the conference, we had gone back to the guest house where we were staying down the road and every night we would get together for dinner and kind of talk about what was happening, talk about the vision, talk about the goals. We just had a really sweet time uh, Thursday. Uh, it was kind of tiring, uh, so Kathy and I went to bed a little bit early. Yeah, all, all of a sudden with the knock on the door, I heard Cyprian's voice saying, Madame Kathy, so I got up right away. I knew that Margaret had not been feeling very well, but she we thought she'd been getting better. I went to the door right away and walked with him to the bungalow right next door to us. And um, he said she had already slipped and fallen and lost consciousness, but came right back and was sitting in bed having difficulty breathing. So I sat right next to her, behind her in bed, and Bud just helped me to breathe with her. And I asked him to give her breath, and I asked for him to give her, her specifically his breath. And um, he helped us to calm things down a little bit. So we, they got her over to um, ER, but I could tell it was very, very grave. And um, um, by the time they got to the hospital, they pronounced her upon her arrival. It's, it's so overwhelming to think, um, saying goodbye to a friend like that in that kind of circumstance, or no, nor do you expect God to say, no, I'm not going to give her my breath right now. Um, but you do know that God is in control. Yeah, one of the things that we really became aware of, the, the communitas, the common mission, the common master, really doesn't change uh, when God calls one home. It's still the same. Uh, we got home midday Friday, and, and Cyprian's house was already full of people and a lot of activity going on. They have very special ways that they're going to honor the person who has passed away. And so that first night, there was over 100 people there at the house. That's just what they do and they spend the night in, in preparation for what's going to happen the next day for the memorial service. We got there, it was just a beautiful day, the rainy season, but the rains held off and about 500 people showed up. At one point, uh, there was no more shade for anybody. They brought in more tents. And the gospel is preached, and that was one of Cyprian's goals, is, is for his family members who don't know the Lord to hear a very clear presentation. There was speaker after speaker after speaker talking about Margaret's impact on them and, and just how important Jesus was. So it was just a great opportunity, um, you know, at the burial grounds to, to really proclaim victory in Christ. You know, it's a, it's a done deal. We know who wins. It was wonderful to share from the word for, for each of us and to share also how special she is to us. There's a saying that, that Drew says a lot, you know, but God in, in, in the Luganda language is Nayakatonda. And we kept hearing that over and over again, you know, but God, Nayakatonda. Church, we talk about this every single week at VG, right? But God, in the midst of pain, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of brokenness, the beauty of the gospel being preached. 
and going forth is still at work here at VG, throughout Africa, in Uganda, throughout the ends of the earth. And so just thank you, church family, for um, your continued support of Cyprian, uh, of Andy and Kathy and their work there. Uh, we weep and we mourn with them and we also rejoice and the hope that we will be with Margaret again soon. And, and so we just wanted to share that story to, uh, as an update and just to say thank you and um, that we can continue to be praying and partnering with Cyprian in the work that God is doing there um, because he's doing amazing things. Amen? He's doing amazing things here in our community as well. We sent um, a lot of kids and youth and students to Hume this last week. Um, they had an incredible week. Um, they are back now, and God is just doing and working in incredible things and, and ways there. And, and our hope is that we would all see the ways that he's doing that in our own lives here in our own community. Um, and that starts with being connected to this community. If you're here today and you're not connected, we wanna change that for you this morning. And so if you could fill out um, the card that's in front of you, if you'd like to fill that out, if you're here for the first time, just help us to get to know you a little bit. We really just wanna come alongside you and the ways that God is moving and working and what he's doing in your life uh, for his glory and be a part of that together as well. Um, basically, camp is coming up. We have over 500 kids signed up for base camp. Is that crazy? Think about that. Um, we are still taking different supplies for the base camp Amazon wish list. That's on the email as well on the website. Um, get connected there, help support just what's going on with base camp. And more than anything, just be praying. Uh, just be praying that God would move and work in a great way at base camp. Um, a lot of yet to believe coming onto campus with friends and being here. And we just really believe God can use these weeks to change a life forever. And so just be praying for base camp and what God is going to do there. And then also um, Father's Day is coming up soon. If anybody didn't know about that, Father's Day coming up next week. Um, we're just going to have a little bit of barbecue some root beer um, and some just good times out on the patio. So just have that on your radar. Um, that'll be coming up next week as well. Fun time just to be in communitas with each other. Uh, we are continuing in Revelation. If you open up your Bibles, we will dive into the wedding celebration of the Lamb. Anybody else ready to dance with me? Right? Like, doesn't that just get you in the right mood? You didn't know that was a worship song, did you? If you think about it, all songs really are worship songs. They're ascribing value. That's what worship is. Sending value to something or to someone. I, I love some of those lyrics, right? Everyone around the world, is that revelation or what? That's what we're talking about. Every tongue and tribe and nation, everyone around the world, are we ready to celebrate? What's your pleasure? Who and what sits on the throne of your heart? That's the question today. And so today we're gonna celebrate our first ever wedding at Vintage Grace. Anyone else excited? Three of us. I'll take seven. There was more. You were just waking up a little bit, right? But like, this is a celebration of the wedding of Christ to his bride. That's what we're looking at today. In fact, at weddings, it's really we're celebrating a covenant. You made a covenant if you're married to your spouse. In fact, some of the common language that we see in many weddings is till death do us what? Part. That's the covenant that we make. It's about allegiance. In fact, that's what we've been seeing all throughout Revelation. We've been seeing that all throughout marriage. We see that our marriage is for the world, that Margaret and Cyprian's marriage was for the world. I talked to Cyprian that next morning, and he said, here's my only prayer, Drew, that I will meet people in heaven because of my wife. And I know that's true because I've met those people already in Africa, that God is doing something to us and through us. And so today we are celebrating his covenant to us, his opportunity, but like every good proposal, when somebody asks, someone else must also receive. They must say yes to that relationship. In fact, the word communitas for me, that language of a common master and a common mission, it came from a youth camp I went to when I was a kid, and there was, they said they're the three biggest decisions you're gonna make in your life, and this is scary, because it's typically between the ages of 18 and 25. Like, who's ready to make those kind of decisions? Who's your master? What's your mission? And the third M was, who's your mate? Who are gonna pursue your master and your mission with? But he is the only one that we have allegiance to. And so today, we are going to celebrate the good times that we have in Christ, which doesn't mean that the rain doesn't fall. It doesn't mean the storms don't come. It doesn't mean that death is not real. It just means that death does not define us, amen? 
And so here's the text and summary statement for today. If your Bible's turned to Revelation, we're covering a lot of text today, chapter 17 through the middle of 19. Hopefully you've pre-read, but here's what we're gonna see. Babylon falls. Now this is not new news. This is not new news at all. It has been happening in a story on repeat throughout all of history. Rome is the Babylon for John, and there were many before him, and there will be many after that. But the truth of the matter is that none of them will stand. So the question is, who's your covenant with? Because your covenant better be something that's valuable, that's worthwhile. And so again, the covenant with Babylon will not stand. This is bad news for those who have devoted their lives to her and who find their joy in the things and place and powers of this world because they will all be destroyed. But for those of us who have accepted the covenant offer from Jesus, for those of us who have said yes when he looked at us and said, will you be mine? I'm not gonna force you. Will you be mine? For those of us that offer of Christ become a part of his bride, this is a day of celebration because he is our salvation. So again, I want you to think about right now, what are the cruddy circumstances in your life? Do you have some of them? What are they? God wins, God is with you, God is for you, and you are betrothed to him. So let's remember that as we open the text today. Revelation chapter 17, we have a lot of text that we're gonna dive into starting in verse one. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come and I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality. With the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers of earth have all become drunk and he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. It had seven heads and ten horns, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. She was adorned with gold and jewels and pearls and holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and impurities of her sexual immorality. On her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes, earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly, John says. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. The dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life for the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This is a call for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. There are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does, while well, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seventh, and it will too go to destruction. The ten horns that you saw are ten kings and have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them. Somebody say amen. amen. For he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. The angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they are and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will fight together. They will make desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled and the woman that you saw in the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Would you pray with me? Father, help us to see how today is a day of celebration. Chapter 17 feels so dark and it feels so real and it feels so prevalent to who we are, to where we are, and yet God, you are good and your love endures. And so Spirit of God, I pray that you would fall fresh on us, that you would speak to us, that you would speak through me, that you would bind me from any confusing thoughts or divergent ideas, but instead that we would see you in your text, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Spirit of God, speak for your glory, we pray. May we receive your invitation. And everybody said, amen. amen. You're like, Drew, I thought you said this was a party. <laughs> Don't worry, chapter 17 might feel bad. Chapter 18 gets worse. We're just not there yet. <laughs> no, today is a day of celebration. And yes, chapter 17 is depressing where we just finished. And yet, John gets this message from Jesus, and I'm convinced Jesus wants to share it with us. Why? Because he loves us. He wants us to see how important our allegiance is how this impacts not just today, but an eternity of tomorrows. 
And so even as he's setting this up, I think today structurally is actually a mere image to chapter 21. We're going to see it a little more by the end of the morning. But here's the ultimate contrast between the old city of Babylon and the new city of Jerusalem. Where do you reside? Where is your residency? That's the question for us today. Who are we actually betrothed to? Who have we made a covenant with that says, till death do us part, and if we love Jesus, we know that death is but a gateway to glory. So there's this ultimate contrast today. Who is she? That's the question I want to start with. There's a lot of characters in the text today, and so we're going to try to do our best to slow down a little bit with 53 slides. My sermons normally have 20 to 30, today has 53. Are you ready? 53 slides today, because the question is, who is she? Who is she that this great harlot, she's got some rad and unique and awful names that they're trying to get our attention. So again, Jesus gives John this vision and John gives it to us. He's been building as we've been introduced to the hero of the world, God, as well as the villains of the world, any and everyone who rejects him who doesn't accept his invitation for relationship. We met God back in chapter one. We also met death in chapter one and the dragon in chapter six. We met the lamb of God. And as we met the lamb of God, we also see the sea beast who opposes the lamb of God. We've met the people of God earlier in the book. And now we meet the people that have rejected God, the people of Babylon. We saw the dragon in chapter 12, the beast in 13, Babylon the Great in 14. And so what I want you to see is as John's been introducing us to the main characters, now we're to the final judgment part. And so as he's introduced characters, now he's going to go in the reverse order. He's going to end with Babylon the Great, which we saw in chapter 14, and now we're going to start with their judgment. We got to see the beast, and next week we're going to look at the beast's judgment. We get to see the dragon, and then the next week we'll look at the dragon's judgment. But there's this contrast between ultimately good and evil, and the question is who wins, but we know that. That's the point of Revelation, to see the future, to see the unyet seen reality of today and an eternity of tomorrows, the question for us then is, where's our allegiance in light of that knowledge? And so here's, we meet her. Then one of the seven angels who just had the seven bowls last week came and said to me, come, I'm gonna show you the judgment of the great prostitute. Who is she? She's the one who is seated on many waters. Remember that language, we'll come back to it. Whom the kings of earth have committed sexual immorality. Now remember, we talk about marriage. Sexuality is all about covenant. It's all about allegiance. Sex is a good thing designed by God to be experienced in marriage. I highly recommend it if you're married. See, we don't talk about it enough. That's why you're like, can I laugh at that? I don't know. This is... Sex was designed by God. It's a beautiful thing. But what sex often shows is a covenant. That's what sex reveals. Where is the covenant? And so pay attention as the harlot. Go read Nahum and Isaiah and Jeremiah. Regularly throughout the Old Testament, we see sexuality in the context of covenant, that we've given our heart to someone or something else, that we've played the role as the sinner, that we've played the role of the prostitute, that we've left our first love, that we've abandoned who Jesus is as the groom for us. And so that's what we see throughout the text, all throughout the Old Testament. And so the great prostitute shows up, and it's not just about sex. It's always about the heart. It's always about who sits on the throne of your heart. And so this great prostitute is seated over many waters with whom the kings of the earth, they have given their hearts to her. They've committed sexual immorality. And with the wine of those whose sexual immorality, dwellers of the earth have become drunk. One of those seven angels, as he goes on, we must recognize, of course, that the Old Testament, that Babylon fell in the Old Testament, that Babylon falls in the New Testament, that Rome is the ones that ransacked Jerusalem. And so that's what we see in the text, the sexual immorality. With the wine of those sexual immorality, the dwellers of earth have become drunk. Every single one on this earth has said, I've given my allegiance away from Christ to someone else. That's what it means to reject him back in the garden. And the angel carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. Now remember the contrast here. It's all about true allegiance versus the fake allegiance that the beast and the dragon are are calling us to have that the prostitute is calling us to have. He came away in the spirit to the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. It had seven heads and ten horns. Now, have we met someone before with seven heads and ten thorns, ten crowns? Absolutely. We saw that back in chapter 12. Chapter 12, we met him. He was one of the beasts. And so we see this, that the beast is representative of Rome. And so again, the the great prostitute is sitting on Rome. They're working together to carry out a mission against God. They're working together to see people get off the throne of their hearts and put anyone other than Jesus on it. 
And so it was the seven heads and 10 horns and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet adorned with gold and jewels and pearls holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and impurities of her sexual immorality. Now again, don't get caught up on that word sexual immorality, he's going to the heart. What are we being wooed towards? So we saw Rome, we saw the power of nationalism. Now we're focusing on specifically the economic beast. That the economic realities of this world, does anyone else get unsatisfied or dissatisfied after they buy something? Someone says, if you just buy this, it's gonna make you so happy. And then you buy it and what happens? It just didn't make me quite as happy as I thought it was going to. That happens with every car that I buy. It happens with every burger that I eat. It happens with pretty much everything because the world is full of powers that are over-promising and under-delivering. Now pay attention how the woman is dressed. She's dressed saying, hey, I'm pretty special. Purple is power, it's economy. Scarlet is this passionate color adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. Now again, she's trying to woo you to say, just trust me, come on, I'm gonna make you happy. But in my experience, the world faithfully and consistently over-promises and under-delivers. That's what we see in the text here. Continuing on, we see in verse five, and on her forehead was written this name of mystery. She even like tells you who she is. I am Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes. Now, again, I don't know about you, but if I'm the mother of prostitutes, what does that mean exactly? It means that not only am I one, but actually all that I breed is gonna be more. All that I breed, Babylon tells us, it's on her forehead. On her forehead, she represents all that John is facing and more. More Babylons are coming. Now, was that true for John? We look back now, we go, absolutely. How many more Babylons came after Babylon? How many more Babylons came after Rome? It's continuing on today. More Babylons, more promises, more ads late at night when you're staying up way too late. More people telling you this will make you happy. You know what else is coming? More pain and more suffering. You're like, Drew, I thought this was the wedding feast. <laughs> Guys, this is the truth for those of us who have rejected the offer of Jesus to be betrothed. There's more promises, there's more pain, there's more suffering, there's more confusion, there's more seduction, there's more settling for lesser joys. That's one of the ways we define sin at Vintage Grace. It's when we buy the lies of the prostitute of Babylon that says, come here, this will make you happy. I will take care of you. I will give you wealth. I will give you health. And the irony in all of this is that wealth will never save us, that health will never save us. In fact, the lack of health is what leads to actually being saved. She represents all that John is facing. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. There's this kind of evil parody that you recognize here between the Lord's Supper. If you haven't gotten your elements, I'd grab your communion elements. We're gonna take it in just a few moments. But there's this parody. What is she drunk with? She's offering you to be drunk with her power, but beyond that, and I saw the woman, she's drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, but God. She's drunk with the reality that as she's reigning in her little empire and what we would call the empire of this world, that she continues to take away Christians one by one. She kills them. She literally takes them out of the picture. Remember, the witnesses rise up, and then what happens? They get killed. See, way too often we live this American Christianity that says, well, I just don't want to die. Well, that's a bummer, because guess what? You're all dying. In fact, some of you are gonna die, that's what the text says here, to this context in Rome, some of you are gonna die because you're choosing to not follow her. Not only does she overpromise and underliver, but if you choose to not follow her, she says, I'm going to kill you, I'm gonna reject you, and yet we know that the church grows rapidly through the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So there's this evil parody that she is drunk on the blood of the martyrs. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. Can we just stop for a moment? The word marvel is only associated with worship. Like, let's pay attention. The world marvels at the beast. Here's John, and what's he doing? Oh my gosh, she's got power. Here's John, the beloved of Jesus, and on some level, I think he misses for a moment. Do you see this? And I marveled. I was overwhelmed by her glory on some level. This counterfeit artificial glory that the world offers us can deceive even the closest of us to Jesus. Don't miss this. And I marveled, and I love the angel. The angel said, you idiot. Don't you love the patience of Jesus? And by the way, please recognize this. This is not in the sermon, so this must be of the Holy Spirit, so this is for someone. Recognize the patience of the people that are representing Jesus. Like this is significant for those of us who have lacked patience with people that are not very smart in our world. Recognize the angel right now is patient with him. He totally misses, and he doesn't say, you're so dumb, why'd you miss this? He says, hey, why do you marvel? Let me tell you the truth of the matter. 
He doesn't yell at him. He doesn't call him an idiot. He doesn't call him names. He just sits with him. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast and the seven heads and the ten horns that carries her. Now, I love this when God says, here's the answer. It's so nice when he tells us this. There's plenty of times in Revelation I get done studying for hours and I go, I still don't know. But this one, he says, let me tell you, you don't need to marvel. It's all fake. It's all counterfeit. Don't marvel. Don't marvel. It's over promises, under delivers. She's not as good as she appears. Let me go on. The beast that saw was and is not and is about to rise from bodies pit and destruction. We've seen this language before. It's a reference to Jesus. Jesus was and is and what? Is to come. Here's a counterfeit. This is what this is all about. Here's a counterfeit. He was and is not and is about to rise from Bob's pit. You're like, yeah, but he's got a future. This is pretty rad. No, no. His future is what? Going to destruction. So yes, she might woo you, but it's only going to lead you to destruction. In fact, that's what we see with the fifth trumpet being blown. We see this reality of this woman that overpromises and underdelivers, and destruction is her name. And the dwellers on earth, though, whose names have not been written in the book of life, foundation of the world, they marvel at the beast, they worship the beast, they follow her because it was not and is not and is to come. This calls to mind with wisdom. Now, I told you guys, I promise, when there's a point that I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. These verses, I don't know. Most commentators go back and forth. This is a hard one. He literally says, this calls for a mind with wisdom. I don't have it. You with me? <laughs> I'm not totally sure. Commentators go back and forth. The seven heads and the seven mountains, which are the woman is seated. We've seen seven mountains. Rome is called the, the city on seven hills. I think that's a safe bet on which the woman is seated. There are also of seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was, is, and is not, and is the, he's the eighth, but he actually belongs to the seventh. Are you with me? You got it? Because if you got it, that's great, because I don't. And note to the commentators, and that's okay with me. I think it's important for, for, again, relational reality and equity to be able to say, I'm not totally sure what this says. I don't know how this all connects. Here's what I do know, though. Many empires are gonna rise, and every one of them is gonna fall. That's what I know. So I don't know for sure which one are we talking about. Are these the emperors of Rome? Are these the kings? Are these Caesar who say that they're kings? There's different arguments, and it doesn't affect the big idea at all. Here's what I do know. Every time power is given, it's never enough. We want more, and we literally will kill each other to get it. That's what I know. Empires faithfully rise, and every time they fall, this isn't new news that, that Babylon's gonna fall. It already did fall. This isn't new news that Rome's gonna fall. It already did fall. This isn't new news that any country that claims allegiance to the point of excluding your allegiance to Christ is going to what? Fall. So don't be caught off guard. It goes to destruction. The text goes on. And then the 10 horns that you saw are 10 kings and have not yet received royal power, but they received authority as kings for one hour. It's limited authority. It's gonna be short-lived. They're gonna promise you an eternity. They don't have that kind of power, but together with the beast, they're gonna do this. They are of one mind. There's this counterfeit trinity of the beast and the dragon and, and even the harlot that they hand over their power and authority to the beast and they will make war on the lamb. That's the purpose of the counterfeit trinity, to make war on the lamb. The lamb will what, church? Conquer them. Church, we just have to remember that because there's points in our life where we're like, oh my gosh, it feels like we're losing. Anyone else watching the Warriors Boston series? Points it feels like we're losing. We have to know the final score. I don't actually know the final score of the Warrior series. I'm just hopeful. We actually do know the final score of our life. We do know the final score of eternity. The Lamb will conquer them because he is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and to those who are called and chosen and faithful. And so again, on some level, this is an answer to the, the, the saints crying out, Lord, how much longer are we gonna have to wait? How much longer will there be bloodshed? How much longer till you see the rubbish of this world and come back? Guess what? Chapter 17 answers the question. It's now. It's game time right now. Now, this is prophetic. This is in the future. So for us, even today, for them and for us, this is in the future. But church, is it not good to know the future? It's a big deal. It changes the way that I interact at halftime. It changes the reality of my emotions because I'm called, because I'm chosen. I can be faithful because I know that he has been faithful. On some level, this reminder that but God overcomes is a callback, I think, to Jesus with his disciples in John chapter 14. In John 14, what Jesus tells his disciples, I'm gonna leave and prepare a place for you. Don't freak out. Do not be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. How did the disciples do with that? So can we just give each other grace and patience when we freak out? Telling someone, why are you freaking out? That's dumb. That's not what the angel does to John. The angel says, hey, you don't have to marvel and worship a counterfeit. You don't have to freak out. God is with you, and God wins. 
How long should we suffer? The time is coming, the time is now. John 14 says that we are being reworked in an eternal sense, and so church, sincerely, turn to your neighbor right now and say, he wins. Somebody say that. He wins. Say, do not fear. You, you do recognize that's a powerful command all the way from the Old Testament through the New Testament to today at Vintage Grace. Do not fear, he wins. Now the yet to believe, they should be afraid. Why? Because their allegiance is not with Christ. That's what we're seeing in chapter 17. Go on to 15, and the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated, all the waters, the prostitute is seated on the beast, and as she's seated, all this is the representation of peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. It's the seventh time now we've seen this. Again, the beast is looking with the prostitute to woo you away, all peoples. And yet what I love is that every judgment before the final judgment, which we're talking about now, every judgment is an opportunity for us to repent, to get off the throne of our heart. And the 10 horns that you saw, they're the beast, they hate the prostitute, they will make her desolate and naked and they will devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. You're like, Drew, this is just intense. Pay attention to what we just read. Who's attacking the prostitute and the 10 horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the who? Wait, I thought you just said they're the counterfeit trinity. I thought you just said they're working together. They are, but you know what's true every time about power? It's never enough and you always wanna kill the person that has more than you. Even the evil ones, they turn on each other. In an empire's quest to control, one commentator said this way, it ends up being devoured by the same people in power they seek to conquer. They partner together until they turn on each other. Now don't miss who's still in control of all of this. It is God that put into their hearts to carry out his purposes. God is still sovereign. God is still controlled by being of one mind and handing over this royal power to the beast for a short period of time until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is this great city has dominion over the kings of the earth. What is the definition of insanity? Expect a different result. Can we just look at history? This isn't new news, guys. Nothing we're watching today on the news is new. Nothing. Assyria got conquered by Babylon. Babylon got conquered by the Persians. The Persians conquered the Greeks. The Greeks got conquered by the Romans. The Romans conquered themselves, if you really study history. <laughs> this is not new news. If our allegiance is in anything and anyone other than Jesus, it and they will fall. You're like, man, this is, this is depressing, Drew. <laughs> nice marriage. You should try again next week. No, no. The benefit of a proposal is simply this. If you say yes, here's the imminent results. If you say no, here's the imminent results. That's the love and the grace of God to say, hey, who do you choose to be betrothed to? The imminent results is chapter 18. Now, in chapter 18, I, I wanna highlight a couple of language that we're gonna see as we read, because we haven't read it yet. Hopefully you pre-read. There's past language, future language, and present language. There's past language, which is fascinating. Why? Because there's prophetic certainty that Babylon fell because it did. And so there's this past language there, but it's also an anticipated future language that Babylon will fall in the future, that judgment day is going to happen, it's going to come. So we have past language, future language, and the present language is simply this, what are you gonna decide? Who are you going to follow? So chapter 18, the angel comes and he says, do you recognize this reality? And so why does John tell us this? Well, because Jesus said to, first of all, why does then Jesus tell John to tell us this? I think because he's giving us an opportunity to come out of Babylon. That until the final destruction of Babylon, which hasn't happened yet because we're all still breathing, we're all here, we live in present day Babylons. And again, where that is, it doesn't matter. It just matters on where you're watching on YouTube. It could be America, because that's where we are now. It could be wherever you are, there's a present Babylon. Why does Jesus tell us this? It's the seventh and final time that John's gonna hear this voice from heaven. Why does he share? Pay attention to verse four in a second. Because he wants us to come out of Babylon. Because he wants us to leave the captivity that the whore offers before in chapter 17. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, the seventh and final time, having this great authority. That's a contrast to chapter 13, verse two, with the artificial authority. There's artificial authority, then there's God authority. Great authority on the earth was made bright with his glory, and he called out with a mighty voice, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. This is the first of really seven different sub-statements. Coming from heaven, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She's become an undwelling place for demons. That's how bad it's become. 
It's this dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the king of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from power and luxurious living. We're gonna see three different people, merchants, kings, and shipmakers. They're gonna have a statement about Babylon. All of them on some level have given their allegiance to Babylon, and now they get to see the future, and they go, can we change? our mind. No, chapter 18 is a beautiful chapter, but it's also painful. I'm going to just read it and let the text speak for itself. Here's the angel going on. Then I heard another voice, the second one from heaven, saying, come out of her, my people. Why am I sharing this? Because I don't want you to stay in Babylon. It's going to look attractive. It's going to look beautiful, but it's over-promising and under-delivering, and God wins. Please don't settle for less. Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins. If you eat her banquet, you will also receive her punishment, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid others back, and repay her double for her deeds, a mix a double portion for her in the cup that she mixed. And she glorified herself. This is a throne issue. She glorified herself, lived in luxury. She gives herself like a measure of torment and mourning since in her heart, this is the issue, the throne of her heart, three things. In her heart, she says this, I sit as a queen, I'm, I'm Lord of all. She says, I am no widow, which simply means that I didn't become Lord of all because I was a widow. I am my own God and mourning I shall never see. This is the arrogance of sin. That's what we're reading. This is the arrogance of sin, and for this reason, her plagues will come in a single day. It's gonna come quick. We don't know when death is gonna come. We don't know when judgment is gonna come, not just our physical death, but the end of Babylon as we know it. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth, here's the first one, the kings of the earth, they've aligned herself, themselves with her. The kings of kings, the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality, the heart issue, lived with her in luxury, will weep and wail over her, and they will see smoke burning, and they will stand far off in fear of her torment. And now they're gonna say, alas, alas, you great city. You city were so good. We thought you were to give us everything we ever dreamt of, Babylon, but in a single hour, your judgment has come. These kings go, uh-oh. I, I told her till death do us part. I made a covenant to her, and now I see the destruction that is coming for her. The merchants coming out from the city center where the kings would have resided. Now the merchants of the earth, they weep and they mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. You told me that this was going to sell forever. You told me that this was going to make me happy for today and forever. Now pay attention. This goes all the way back, I think, to Ezekiel chapter 27. You can read it on your own time. In Ezekiel 27, you're going to see 40 different things and, and categories. That's four times 10. That's a complete list in Ezekiel 27. Guess what? This list has 28. I think it's the number seven times four. Again, lots of numerology all throughout the text. That's what we see, that this holy, complete list that over-promises, that under-delivers. The kings and now the merchants, they say, wait, we thought this is what would make us happy, and now we see this text that says, stop investing in the things that won't actually make you happy. What are the things that we think will make us happy? Gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen. There's seven categories here. Purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented woods, all kinds of articles of ivory. Stop nudging your spouse right now. No, seriously, like we read this and we always think about someone else and we're like, would you, the Bible says stop spending at Bed Bath & Beyond. Don't you see that? <laughs> now just pay attention. This is not written to us, but it is written for us. All of us are susceptible to thinking that this costly wood or bronze or iron or marble or cinnamon or spice or incense or myrrh or frankincense or wine or oil or fine flour or wheat or cattle. Now wives, nudge your husbands. I love beef. God loves beef, fine cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, slaves, that is human souls. Guys, we think these things will make us happy. This list, I think, climaxes all the way to slavery. It's unacceptable that we think that we're God, that we think that we have the power to make ourselves happy, and yet apart from God, we will never be happy. We'll be on an eternal hamster wheel looking for something that will satisfy. And the merchants of the earth, they see the future and they say, what are we spending our life doing since none of this will actually make us happy? What are we doing? 
He goes on from the merchants to the shipmakers. The shipmakers then say, the fruit from your soul long and has gone from you, and your delicacies, your splendors, they're all lost, never to be found again. Is your life meaningful? The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her, they will stand far off, and in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud, and the merchants say, alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. In a single hour, it's gone. What a depressing thought. Your entire life, all your life savings will never save your life. Amen? Amen. In a single hour, it's gone. And all the shipmasters, the seafaring men, the sailors, all those who trade with the sea, they stood far off and they cried out as they saw smoke from her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and they wept and mourned, crying aloud, alas, alas, the great city where all the ships at sea grew rich by her wealth but in a single hour has been laid to waste. And then there's this kind of anonymous voice. I don't think it's one of the people on earth with their perspective, it could be an angel, says rejoice over her, O heaven. You saints and apostles and prophets of God have given judgment to you against her. Rejoice? Why would I rejoice over the destructions of people's entire lives dreams? Because right to this point, remember all the way back in chapter six, verse nine, the saints crowd say, God, are you paying attention? God, these people, they're getting everything they ever wanted. And he says, no, in time they're gonna get what they deserve. Rejoice because I'm a holy, righteous God and I do not let evil go unpunished. I will deal with slavery once and for all. I will deal with the the gospel of, of success and wealth once and for all. I will deal with the evil of this world and the injustice and the wrath is coming. And so church, please hear me. He says rejoice. Now we're not rejoicing in others getting wrath. Why? Because we recognize that at Vintage Grace, we love the sinner and we hate my sin. We don't love the sinner and hate the sin. We love the sinner and hate my sin. Why? Because my sin deserves what? Wrath. So I don't rejoice in the fact that they're getting what they deserve. No Christian would ever say that, ever. No Christian would ever say it. The Christian would rejoice in the fact that I'm not getting what I do deserve because Jesus got it for me, amen? That's mercy. Mercy's not getting what you deserve. So again, don't read through that word rejoice too quickly. Why are we rejoicing? Not because they're getting what they deserve. We're rejoicing because we're not getting what we deserve because Jesus, who knew no sin, became all of my sin so that I might become a son or daughter again. That's what we're rejoicing over, that God is not turning his blind side to evil. He's gonna deal with it, but he's been holding off. Why? Because he wants as many people as possible to get out of Babylon. He wants as many people as possible to repent, to get off the throne of their heart, and to come back. The result of the cries of the saints is that God will not let it go unseen or unpunished, that he is holy and that he is righteous and his judgment is right. And so those of us who have received the grace of God, the mercy of God, we better be the quickest to dispense it, amen? We better be the quickest to go to the kings and the shipmasters and the merchants and say, hey, when you're starting to recognize that that your empire that you're building isn't gonna actually make you happy, would you please consider Jesus because he changes everything. The text goes on, then a mighty angel took a stone like a great millstone and he threw it into the sea. Now this is a sign of punishment. Go read Jeremiah and Isaiah and Jeremiah 51. So will Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. Church, don't read this too fast. We live in a world that we are building our own empires and every empire will rise and every empire will fall. Whose betrothing have you accepted? The sound of the harpists, the musicians, the flute players, the trumpets, they're never gonna be heard anymore. The craftsmen of any craft, they're not gonna be found in you no more. The sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of the lamp will shine in you no more. The voice of the bridegroom, the bride, will be heard in you no more. It's heard right now, wooing you. Get off the throne of your heart. Come back to me. Come out of Babylon. Come to me. But the day is coming where he will no longer woo. And just judgment will come for you. And I share that because I love you, because he loves you. And he shares this because he wants you to repent. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and all who've been slain on earth. That there's eternal effects to the choices that we make, to the opportunities that we receive. Margaret has been a dear friend over years. You heard part of her story with Cyprian. This was Margaret's last last Facebook post before she died. If the living knew what the dead knew, the whole world would follow Jesus. I kind of want that to be my last Facebook post. (laughs) If the living knew what the dead knew, they wouldn't waste their time trying to become a king or merchants or ships. They would just worship Jesus, amen? Amen. Guys, celebrate, good times are coming. Who are you worshiping? And in chapter 19, verse one, I love this. I love chapter 19. 
Because chapter 17, 18, that's tough, and I deserve the wrath of God. That's what I deserve. But God, out of his great love, shows me the future so that I don't settle for lesser joys today. And after this, John says, I heard what seemed to be this loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. Who's the multitude in heaven? Those who actually trust and treasure Jesus. Not everybody rejects the offer of the lamb, crying out hallelujah. Go read Psalm 113 through 118. You'll see the halal, the praise of God. The praise of God, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For his judgments are true and just, and he has judged the great prostitute. He does not deal with her evil any longer who corrupted the earth and immorality. And he has avenged the blood of his martyrs. He avenges the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, hallelujah, the smoke goes up from her forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures, they fall down, they worship God who was seen on the throne, saying amen, hallelujah. And from the throne comes this voice saying, praise God for all all you his servants who you fear him, small and great, praise God. There's more hallelujahs. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty pearls of thunder, crying out hallelujah, for the Lord our God is almighty. He reigns. That's a title we've seen seven times in this text. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And so church, here's my question. Are you betrothed? Who sits on the throne of your heart? Who has the allegiance? Who has this seat? It's either you or Jesus. The enemy actually doesn't even care if it's you. It could be anyone other than Jesus. But the marriage is coming. The marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Church, are we ready for that day? Are we preparing our hearts for that day? Now pay attention. How do we make ourselves ready? It was granted her to clothe herself. None of us wake up in the morning and go, oh, I got it, I'm ready. I, I, I'm ready, I, I've earned my salvation. Guys, we've earned the wrath of God. That's all we've earned. That's all we've earned. No, the righteousness of God was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, and the fine linen is the righteous deeds of who? Of the saints. Church, don't miss this. We are not saved by what we do, but what we do shows whether or not we've been saved. It shows who sits on the throne of our heart, the way in which we spend our time, our treasure, and talent. And so please hear me. We are saved by grace alone through faith. That's it, Paul says. And yet also, if we're saved, we got work to do. Why? Because Babylon's falling. And we have people that we need to resist Babylon and invite to the kingdom. Amen? That's the offer of the wedding. That's this covenant that he gives us. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper. You all now have been invited because you've sat in sermons at Vintage Grace where I know you've heard the invitation to get off the throne of your heart. You've been invited. All I want for you as a pastor is I want you hashtag blessed. Pay attention to what that means. It doesn't mean the white picket fence. It doesn't mean healthy, wealthy kids. It means that you trust and treasure Jesus. It means you have a spiritual perspective. Seven times we see the word blessed in the text. Blessed are those who read, hear, and keeps the prophecy. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Blessed are those who stay awake, who keep the garments on of righteousness. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's today. So church, have you accepted? It's that simple. Have you accepted the offer of Jesus? Get off the throne of your heart and be betrothed to him and to him alone. And then I fell down at his feet to worship him. What? He's worshiping the angel. He says, man, blessed is those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And then he said to me, these are the true words of God. And I, John, fell down at his feet to worship the angel. And the angel's like, oh, silly John. <laughs> I love this, why? Because we're also tempted to worship anyone and anything that we think will bring us closer to, to eternity. And so in this context, he even worships the angel. And the angel says, no, 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 don't do that. You must not do this. I'm just a servant with you and your brothers who hold testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. There's this covenant that happens in marriage. There's this covenant that happens in sex. There's this covenant that happens in, in eating food and sitting at the banqueting table and accepting the invitation to show up at the wedding. There's this covenant that happens. And the angel says, the only covenant that you should have is with God himself. That's it. And so what are the implications for us? I mean, there's this huge building text. The text is so deep. It's so wide. Talk to your life group. I, I think the structure of this text, this is structure from Beal. It's given to us to show that the counterfeit nature of Babylon is not gonna be worth the new city of Jerusalem to come. So that's what we see. In fact, all these verses, chapter 17, then one of the seven angels said, come, I'll show you. Come, I will show you the bride. That's what we care about in chapter one. He says, yeah, but it's in the wilderness. That, that's where the, the beast, and that's where not only the beast, but the harlot lives, and yet Jesus carries away in the spirit to a great high mountain, not the wilderness, but the mountain, shows us the holy city 
19, then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. In 22, we worship God, and that's it. And so that's the question for you and I today. I wanna invite you to just hold your communion elements as we just talk for a moment. As we prepare our hearts, not just for today, but for an eternity of tomorrow. Church, every one of us this morning is waking up in Babylon. Every one of us. We're waking up in a world, this comes from a commentator, Daryl Johnson, that I've enjoyed reading these last few months. He says, there's seven signs of Babylon in the text this week. I just wanna read them to you. Leaving the living God out of the equation. Sensuality, injustice, worship of products, violence, deception and counterfeit, idolatry and total allegiance. Does that sound like our world or not? It does. And it's the same world that Jesus gives the message to John to give the message to the early church in Rome. Because it's not new news. It's all about the throne of our heart. And the implication is, church, we are waking up in Babylon today. And so the two implications for me is simply this. Don't be caught off guard. Don't be surprised. We should watch the news because we want to know what our, our friends are feeling and we want to know how to point them to Jesus. But the news doesn't define us. Wait, you're telling me that we don't watch movies without lots of sensuality and lots of killing and lots of settling for less? That is the definition of the entertainment industry today, is it not? It's a reflection of our hearts. It's a reflection of the harlot. It's a reflection of us settling for less. And so church, don't be caught off guard. When a new country shows up and a new power and a new person and any advertisement shows up and promises you to make you happy, call it for what it is. It's a lie from the pit of hell. It's gonna lead you to settle for less. Don't be caught off guard, church. Your throne is worth fighting for. And if you've never repented of God of your heart, can I just encourage you, it's not too late. I don't know why you're here in a deep dive into Revelation if you don't trust and treasure Jesus yet, letting this man that sweats too much confuse you completely. <laughs> but I do know that God loves you. I know that he wants to spend eternity with you, that he has spent all of your life pursuing you and saying, psst, I love you. You just gotta trust me. And if you've got a question about what that means, would you ask the person that invited you? Would you put a note on your connect card? Would you talk to somebody after service? Because here's the deal. The power of this world is like an hour and it's gonna come quick and it's gonna be over faster. Are we ready? Church, for those of us who trust and treasure Jesus, can we recognize that Babylon falls? Amen? Amen. So let's stop investing in it. Let's stop giving Babylon our emotions, our time, our treasure, our talent. Let's repent over all those lesser joys. Let's repent over all the sins of sexuality, of sensuality, but let's recognize that it's all about the covenant of our heart. May we repent. And so communion's a time for us to repent. Would you just open the wafer? If you don't trust in treasure Jesus, communion is something that we do as a church family, and we do it every so often. It feels like in Revelation we're doing it a lot because we need to do it a lot. Because there's lots of reminders that we're settling for lesser joys. There's lots of reminders that Babylon is going to fall. And so communion's a time for you and I to stop where we are and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I've given my heart to anyone or anything other than you. So church, take this time to repent because that sin cost Jesus his life. Take the wafer and break it. Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, he said, this is for you, saints. This is my body that's broken for you. This is right after he says, don't be troubled. Don't freak out. Sometimes we're just repenting over our freaking out, our, our lack of faith, our lack of trust, our lack of treasuring. And this is his body broken for you. Take this in remembrance of him. If you take the cup and open, would this be a chorus of our confession? The sound of these cups opening. I'm just convinced that's one of the best worship songs we sing at Vintage Grace. I am nothing, yet you bid me come to you, O Lord Almighty. Your body and your blood conquers all. It conquers all my sin. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Take this in remembrance of him. And so Jesus, we praise you. We praise you because we receive the sweet taste on our lips not of the wine that the harlot offers to distract and to destroy, but of the blood that is a symbol of your life and your death that you gave for our life and our death. That we know that Babylon's gonna fall, but in you, Christ, we know that you conquer it all. That Babylon's falling, but the bridegroom is returning. And that you've made a way when there was no other way for us to be prepared, for us to be ready, and it's in you, Jesus, and you alone. 
So on behalf of our church, Father, I repent and I apologize and I confess of all the times this week and this month that I've put other things, myself included, on the throne of my heart. I get off of it so that we, like your bride, can be ready to be received by you, that Jesus, you came and you made a way when there was no other way, that you, the lamb, conquers all, and it's in you, Christ, and you alone. Let's praise him right now.
I hated it. I always had to go last. I hated being told, don't talk with your mouth full. I'm like, look, we're just doing what we think is going to make us happy. There's a whole world that's watching from the outside, looking for the things that are going to make them happy. Church, we gather every Sunday to come and receive the grace of God, to come and taste and see that He is good, that He's coming back. And that when he does, for those of us who are betrothed, it is a good day. But until that day, there's a truckload of neighbors and friends and family that aren't gonna actually eat of the cake, that aren't gonna come and receive that he is good. And so church, today's our first wedding at Vintage Grace. I think it's appropriate that it's metaphorical. It's not our wedding, it's, it's his. And so as you leave today, would you grab a piece of cake? Would you take a moment and just eat cake? This is like an ask from your pastor. He's asking you to eat cake and to receive and to take a bite. Even if you don't like cake, just take a bite and let it be an act of worship because whenever I eat cake, it's an act of worship. (laughs) It's an act of remembering of joy and of eternity. And Jesus tells us the unseen reality of today and the unseen reality of tomorrow. And so as we leave, may we go celebrate May you take a piece of cake. May you take a moment. You've had communion. This is like communion. It's different, but it's like communion. And remember that he is good, that he alone is good, and that he's coming back to redeem his people. And so as we go this week, we go in the power of the Holy Spirit. May we have the eyes of the Spirit. May we have the satisfaction of the Spirit. So as the world is looking to Babylon to make them happy, may they see that there's something better than even cake. His name is Jesus. Would you open your hands to receive the benediction? Spirit, fall on us. Fill us with cake, literally and metaphorically. Fill us with your joy and your goodness. So as we leave this place, may that be what we take with us. That we are saved, that we are redeemed, that we are rescued, that we are no longer defined by sin, but we are defined by you, Jesus, and you alone. Our allegiance is to you. Our allegiance is for you. And we ask that you would lead through us this week for your glory and for the good of our family and friends, we pray. Church, go eat cake. Go receive the benediction. Go be the grace of Jesus to your family and friends. Go in peace and serve the Lord. And everybody said, amen.